Um, okay, so it is now, it's now time uh, for us to get into business already exactly time. I take the pleasure to welcome all of us who are already on uh, online. I know many others are still are still joining. Uh, but for those of us who are already there, uh, I welcome you uh, to our June Echo session. Um, and as usual, our ground rules, housekeeping rules remain. When you when you you are not the one holding the floor, keep yourself on mute so that we completely avoid feedback that will interfere with the with the session. So if you're not the one speaking or you're not given opportunity to speak, keep yourself on mute. Then register your presence by going to the chat and uh, write your names and where you're connecting from. If you're more than one, one at your station, uh, you register the other people that are with you so that we can also monitor the attendance, how many people have been on this call. Uh, should you have uh, a question in the process as the presenter presents, uh, just note it down. Go into the chat and note the question down. That quickly helps uh, that we are able to, you know, to take track of the question. Somebody is monitoring the chat and will be able to pull out the questions at the right time and make them available uh, to be answered. So don't wait at the end to pose your question. Do that in the process as the call goes on. Um, uh, then as, uh, as, as, as always, we, we have uh, people who are doing some housekeeping, who are doing mute and unmute. So if you are not muting yourself, somebody will be able to put you off, especially if they are echo calls coming uh, from, from your side. It is best that to avoid any ground, background interference. Uh, the rest of all of us, apart from one person who is speaking at a time, should be on mute. So today, uh, we are delighted uh, uh, once again to have this call. And uh, unlike most of the calls we have, today we have the civil society. We have the civil society uh, coming in so that we get their perspective. Uh, we, we are going to be uh, having the perspective of uh, civil society uh, from somebody who has been in this field for over 20 years and uh, is personally impacted, but is also making a lot of impact by doing a lot of advocacy. Uh, he's a peer educator is an advocate and uh, a, a big influence, especially to the adolescents that are impacted by the HIV uh, scourge. So he comes from a very wealthy background of experience that is going to be sharing with us. Um, what what uh, we are going to be touching today is still on, uh, on, 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 on viral load and how viral load is a game is, a, is a life is transformatory, uh, can change, can completely change your one's life, as we shall hear uh, from the experience of Moses, uh, who, uh, whose life was completely uh, changed and was given a, a bill of life again because of viral load. And uh, he will be sharing his experience, which, which is quite moving. So as we talk about this, uh, it really touches on our key principal areas that we want to focus on, which is demand creation and results utilization. You will see in his, ex, in his sharing that uh, he, he critically touches on demand creation involving the, the civil society and also result utilization, making sure that eventually results end up impacting patient care. So uh, we, we, I think, we wouldn't find somebody better at sharing and showing the impact and the importance of viral load 
as Moses, as you will see, as you will hear, as he shares his, uh, his experience and his life testimony of how viral load and, uh, and, and HIV intervention gave him a bill of, of life and uh, is a great influence, not only locally, not only regionally, but internationally. He's doing lots of advocacy. So we are delighted to have Moses, uh, uh, Moses in Subuga, uh, 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 popularly known as Supercharger. He will tell us where that name comes from, Supercharger. So Moses, you are welcome. I give you the floor. And uh, yes, on. Hello, Moses, you are on mute. You need to unmute. Okay, let me unmute you. Okay. Do you know Moses, you are on mute? Please unmute yourself. I'm still, still on mute. Okay. Yeah. I'm still on mute. Okay. okay. Now we need to. Wow. Okay. Okay. You go on now. You are off. You are off mute. I'm off mute. Yeah, you can speak now. Okay. Good morning and good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, they've already introduced me, but I can talk about myself briefly. I'm called Moses in Suboga Supercharger. I'm an artist in the country. I'm a radio and television DJ, but I'm an activist and advocate. Uh, I've come to discuss with you the issue around viral load testing and how it has impacted my life. But before, I want to talk about myself. Um, I told you I'm a supercharger, an artist in the country, but I've been a person who has been living with HIV since 1994. Uh, it was around 1992. Uh, I had a beautiful wife with three beautiful children. And my beautiful wife had heard about the virus called HIV. But at first, uh, HIV was referred to be a witchcraft from Tanzania. So my wife sat me down and said, Moses, I've heard that there is witchcraft we are coming from uh, Tanzania. They have told me that actually, uh, when you sleep with somebody's wife, uh, that man can send you the witchcraft, uh, which will make you thin, which will make you fall sick every day. And her main concern was that since I was jumping around with girls, that I could, uh, she had heard that actually when you get the virus, that witchcraft, you can even pass it to your official wife. So I could not listen to uh, my wife at the time. I continued misbehaving. I continued the reckless uh, kind of life I was leading since I was, I was a musician. And in 1994, I began falling sick. I decided to go and do an HIV test. And around that time, the HIV test used to take 14 days. And in Uganda, we could only do it at only one center, which was called Bowman Center opposite the Parliament of Uganda. So I went and did the test, and it proved that I was HIV positive. I was so shocked. Uh, straight away, I went and told my wife about it. And my wife was also shocked, but we decided that we should go and do a, 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 a test together, an HIV test together. And then fortunately, her results turned out to be negative and the uh, result proved to me uh, that confirmed to me that I was positive because I was really saying, maybe I'm not, maybe I'm not. So the second test proved to me that I was positive. And from that test, things began to change and my wife refused to go back home uh, she just sent somebody to pick the children. She disappeared from me. She took away the children, and I began a lonely life. I did not access treatment from 1994 until 1998. You can imagine, I was in denial for four years. I had tested positive in 94, but still in denial. In between around 1996, I resorted to witchcraft. And yet I had tested positive for HIV, thinking that actually fellow artists were bewitching me. So uh, in 1998, that's when I started treatment. When I started treatment, it was very, very, very expensive at that time in 98. It was not free as it is now. So I accessed treatment, which was like $300 every month. And I could not afford this kind of money. So what I did, 
as a wise man, I said I'll get the treatment and improvise with it. I could buy medication for one month and use it to take me for like three months. Take today and skip four days. Take two days and skip five days, such that the medication for one month can take me for like three months. So I, I continued that kind of life, but I was improving. But around 2000, after like one year and a half, because I started in 98, around 2000, I felt sick again. This time around, it was really very grave, very serious. And this time around, my relatives got to know about my sickness and everyone was crying. Everyone thought I was going to die. So they picked me from where I was hiding and they took me to my auntie's place. And uh, everyone converged. And at my auntie's place, something happened which turned my life. Something happened at my auntie's place, which was the cause of the work that I'm doing today. Relatives were like 20, they converged and had a meeting at my auntie's place. Remember, I was very sick. The whole body had paralyzed, but I could hear everything they were discussing. So the discussion was centered around my life. Everyone was saying, I have HIV, I'm going to die. And I'm... their major concern in that meeting was that when I die, it will be very expensive to take my dead body to my ancestral home, which is around 145 uh, miles away from Kampala. So that was their main concern. The concern was not to take me for a better treatment or to find me treatment, but their concern was when I die, taking a dead body, it will be very expensive. So in that meeting, they decided that the following day they should arrange uh, two aunties of mine, they should take me to ancestral home by bus, by public means, which is cheaper. You just sit 10,000, 10,000 each, then you go. The following day, they did that. They put me on a bus or went, but something like 30 miles to my ancestral home. The condition deteriorated so much and I was kicked out of the bath because I was throwing up so much and everyone in the bus was complaining. So I was kicked out of the bus and we sat at a place called Kakoge and I waited there. My aunties organized what they call a pickup truck. These trucks that bring coffee. So when they were going back, they asked one of them, we have a very sick person, we need help. So the man accepted to take us. And they, uh, they put me on a pickup and we drove. So when we reached a place called Nakasongola town, just like 20 miles to my ancestral home, that is where all the public men stop. This gentleman accepted to drive us until the, our ancestral stop. Now another meeting. My aunties and uncles had another meeting. This is the only chance we have had this man, when he dies tomorrow, the other day, we shall not have time to come back to this town to buy materials for his burial arrangement. So in Nakasongola town, they bought all the necessary burial arrangements. They bought the cement. They bought the coffin. They bought the iron sheet. They bought the katimba uh, and put everything beside, beside me on a pickup. And then we drove to Kitaraganya. Uh, I will be so fast. God is good that I did not die the following day as they had uh, uh, anticipated. Uh, then after like three days, I had a lovely sister who happened to be the former member of parliament for Ontenjiru North, Honorable Sarah Nansuboga Nyombi, was her brother at the time, but she returned and she asked about me and they told her I'd been taken to the village uh, to await for my death. I have no future, I'm going to die anytime. And she was like, no, I have heard about a clinical joint clinical research center, which can work on Moses please, you, should, you did bad to take him to the village. So she mobilized the transport after four days, collected me from Kitalaganya and took me to Joint Clinical Research Center, where tests were done and they realized that I had developed HIV drug resistance and they were switching me to a more complicated medication. This medication changed my life. I was asking questions why. I was taking two tablets and now they are giving me six plus a septrin which is like seven tablets, it was too much for me. And I was like, no, I can't handle. If it is, if I can go back to the other one, let me go back to the other one. And the doctors told me, once you have failed, you have failed. That was the moment when I asked myself so many questions that if me supercharged, the person who went to school, somebody who has even access to internet, if I didn't know that when you don't take your medications correctly, when you don't monitor your treatment correctly, 
you experience HIV drug resistance. And it's dangerous to you and to the economy of the state. That was the turning point of my life. I said from there, I will begin to educate a uh, community about the importance of treatment and the importance of uh, monitoring your treatment. So that viral test that was done at the Joint Clinical Research Center, when they were switching me to second line, turned my life. I said I need an advocacy. I need to start educating community about uh, this important tool. Uh, those days we used, uh, before, it was very expensive and it was only done to uh, people who were being expected that, 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 that they were really in grave uh, condition. Thank God now that it can be done to every person on what? On, uh, on, on, on treatment. So I told you uh, that I started treatment in 98. It failed in 2000. And it failed because it was very expensive. I was not adhering to the treatment. And uh, I experienced resistance. And I was switched to second line. Now, when I was switched to second line in 2000, I was given a medication that is kept in a fridge, and I didn't have a fridge. And I uh, can imagine that uh, I created and invented a local fridge in my home. I dug a pit in my home and put stones down there, put water there, put cold piece of cloth there where I could place my, my medication. The medication was called Caletra, and it was really very hard, and uh, it was not uh, as easy. So... During my first viral report, me, when the doctors explained to me, and then I began my uh, viral load uh, advocacy. People live who know their viral load tests normally perform better, but the problem we have here in Uganda that most people don't know what it is, don't demand for it. Um, uh, there is a lot of challenges when it comes to this important intervention. Uh, the biggest problem is. Yeah, that supply of this service in Uganda is greater than demand. People don't demand for this service, which is available in Uganda. But you can't demand for what you don't know. Majority of people living with HIV don't know about this intervention. They need knowledge about it. They need knowledge about its importance. Health workers, they need to take initiative of educating us about this intervention. And health workers, when you do the tests, you are very fast in collecting samples and take, doing the, the, the testing, the viral testing, but, and send the test back to the treatment centers. But a client to get the results, it takes him like five to six months. Actually, you only know about your viral, your viral load test, which you did five months ago, when you go for your next um, appointment. To me, viral load is my power. I can't miss it at all because uh, it's very important to me and my partner. I uh, uh, have a beautiful partner and uh, I'm telling you she's so much interested in this intervention because after knowing uh, that there was a study which proved uh, it was called HPTN052, which we got to know about that actually when you treat a person living with HIV and he takes his medication properly, he checks his viral load periodically and is undetectable, he cannot pass the, the, the virus to the partner. That study really changed my girlfriend when she got to know, from that time when the results were released, she picked interest in knowing my viral load status. And actually every time I go for a, a viral load test, we go together, she reminds me always when it's due and when I'm abroad, when I travel, she will make sure WhatsApp me or give me a call. Baby, did you take your medication? Why? She wants me to be undetectable. And the best way you can know that you are undetectable is to do a viral load test. But this information is not in our people. Uh, it is in very few people. Results may come early, but a client will know the results until his next hospital visit. Like I've said, we need to do more there. Um, improving viral test is very important. Uh, how best can we do it? Some of the suggestions. Viral testing should be uh, a community-friendly uh, friendly intervention. Community, we must be uh, involved in this, in this intervention. As it is now, uh, we have very little knowledge about it, and we have very little participation in it. Let's create champions of this intervention at 
almost every health center. Let's create champions about viral load testing. Uh, networks of people living with HIV can organize regional viral load conferences. I've never had a regional viral load conference which has been organized by networks of people living with HIV. It's really missing. Uh, we need an, uh, to be this intervention to be translated into our local languages. Okay, my advocacy. I formed a group called Stigma Less in the year 2000. These are young persons who are born with HIV. I said I would start with these ones. What do we do? We pass the information to the general public whenever we get chance, especially the fellow young persons. And we do it through music, dance, and drama. As you see, I met them in 2000. That's a picture of the, some of the youth. They are close to 50 youth. The group is called Stigma Less Uganda. And we have been invited to uh, several conferences, uh, international conferences, though the national conferences do not involve us, like the international conferences. It's really surprising. We have been to Durban, we have to Melbourne, we have been at uh, ICASA, and, uh, and we have been to uh, Netherlands, the, the recent one. And uh, these are young persons who are born with HIV, but uh, they take their medications correctly, monitor their treatment, do a viral load every year because they know what it means and its importance. Like I said, Stigma Less Uganda provides psychosocial support to fellow young persons. Our goal is to uh, give them hope and happiness, fellow young persons. The activities that we do, we interact with young people, uh, visit hospitals and clinics, visit schools. If you have a meeting like a conference, you want us to entertain you, you want us to give you testimonies, each and every young person you see there, you saw there, has a testimony to tell. What are the challenges? The challenges that I've really incurred as supercharger uh, for more than two decades of my advocacy is limited funding for the activities. I don't have any kind of funding, and the work that I do, I fund it myself, I move myself, and uh, the, 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 the kind of support that I only get in this struggle is to, when they invite me to attend to a conference, that's when they buy me a ticket, they buy a flight ticket, that's when they give me accommodation, they give me some upkeep, full stop. But when I come back to Uganda, I need some kind of a project that can take me, uh, that can take me to, uh, to, uh, to, uh, to the local people. I need some kind of a project that can take me to the masses, that can pass the, the, the message to the masses. In Uganda, we have over 100 radio stations, and I'm a radio DJ. But I've never heard a song about viral load testing. It's not there. I've never heard a song about viral load testing. It's not there. And this is something I can do. But nobody to fund such kind of a project. You need a song. You need like 5 million shillings to produce such a song, which is like $1,200 dollars. Nobody can provide that, that kind of money. But such a song will go to all the 100 radio stations. Such a song can be heard by all people living with HIV. Uganda, we have 1.3 million people on treatment. And already 150 have failed first line. They're on second and third line. They need this kind of information, the importance of uh, a viral load testing. Denial, that's a very big problem. Poor adherence in children, we're experiencing resistance. And the majority of the people who are failing treatment are uh, young persons below the age of 25 in Uganda. And why are they failing? They are failing because of poor treatment literacy. When people are being initiated on treatment, there is no intervention to explain the importance of the treatment they're about to start, the repercussions of not taking the medications correctly, that when you don't take this medication, you'll experience A, B, C, D. And how do you... Uh, take this medication correctly, what are you supposed to do so that you don't experience HIV drug resistance? One of the things is to do a viral load test periodically. Such things are not there. The doctors in Uganda don't have that time. And we don't blame them because they are very few. Is one, he has to meet like 100 clients. So more has to be done. There's a lot of stigma, both internal and external stigma. And my recommendations, Clinicians should educate clients about viral load testing. That is very, very important. Clinicians, you need to do more to educate 
clients about virologists. And you can't do this kind of work alone. You need expert clients like Supercharge at each and every treatment center to help you to pass this information to uh, fellow clients. I need a program where I can create champions, where I can create expert clients like me who can pass this information to fellow people living with HIV. Clinicians should actively track patients due to viral testing. Clinician must explain the viral test results. That is happening in Uganda. Somebody, I asked a client, have you ever done a viral test? I don't know what it is. And then I followed and checked in his file and he had done the test for the last 10 years he has been doing the test and he doesn't know what he's doing. So the doctors don't take initiative to explain, but it's good he was doing well. Ensure efficient, uh, efficient quality viral testing. There is a very gap, big gap between the, the health worker, the laboratory uh, managers, and the community. We need to bridge that gap. Laboratory experts and their uh, clinicians and uh, people who do the viral test, you are on your island and we are on our island. We need interventions where we come together and discuss and hear our stories, you hear our concerns, but that is not happening in Uganda. What should be the role of the government? The government of Uganda is doing uh, an amazing job. We thank you and the partners. But our biggest concern right now is that viral load tests, this important intervention, 90% of the funds that manage it are being given by somebody, not the government of Uganda. Our concern as civil society and people living with HIV is that if anything happens, and this person cannot give you more funds to do this important intervention. What will happen to the 1.3 million people? So our urge and uh, cry and advocacy is that the government should set up an AIDS trust fund. There was a proposal uh, by parliament to set up this AIDS trust fund and it just died like that. So we need this uh, trust to be set up. We need, we need it badly. Government should formulate policies to promote viral testing, like every, uh, put ev uh, every client on treatment. You are doing a very good job on putting everyone on, on treatment, but we are not doing so much and making sure that they are uh, suppressed. And the best way you can know that they are suppressed is to do an annual viral test. Uh, we need to mobilize partners. Networks of people living with HIV, they are not doing a, enough to promote viral load testing. The networks of people living with HIV, and you have so many, many in Uganda, and they are being funded. But you hear them cut a lot of noise in other things, not viral load testing. I need these networks of people living with HIV to lead in this fight. What we need is demand. We need to create demand. And the best way to create demand is to get all these people with HIV people on treatment to know the importance of the intervention so that they can start demanding for it. That is the best way. But the networks of people living with HIV are really disappointing. The role of partners. Partners should mobilize funding for community viral load awareness and education. We have got a lot of ideas which can bring this intervention to the community, but we don't have funding. I, I tell you, I have another idea. Apart from creating a viral load song, I have an idea. We have major roundabouts in Kampala. At this time in the evening, cars jump park there and people are there stuck for like 30 minutes, 45 minutes. I can use that every day to go there and stand there and preach the gospel of viral load testing and preach the gospel of treatment and preach the dangers of HIV drug resistance. I can do that with my team but there's no funds to do that kind of work. Now, take home messages. The viral testing is a power in the treatment of HIV, and we should really work hard to make sure that uh, everyone gets it, gets the viral testing. Thank you so much. I will take your questions. Okay, okay. Thank you, thank you very much, Moses. That was uh, 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 terrific. I was particularly touched by, by the fact that uh, you were loaded on a truck with the, the burial materials. 
that that that, that is a big uh, that is a story a moving story with everything that is going to be used to bury you uh but today you are here speaking and thanks to the interventions that have kept you up and running and thank you also for not pulling away and uh, living on your own but feeling a, a gap that uh, many others would shy away from feeling to say let me come out and speak and when you speak it makes a lot of sense because you 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 you, you have an experience none of us would no one can fake it it is something that no one can just walk and pick it's it's too personal so we want to thank you for coming out and your message is hard wide and uh, and 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 uh, loud and clear and uh, the fact that civil society should be at the forefront uh, we don't uh, need not to be overemphasized and funding for civil society to actually do the mobilization of the rest of the community members for these interventions is something that doesn't need to be overemphasized so i think the message has been heard i know there have been uh, 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 questions I think that have been coming through. I will ask, uh, uh, I think Nicholas, who's been uh, monitoring the chat, uh, to start reading out the questions for Moses. Thank you very much, Dr. Price. Now we have a couple of questions in the chat. I think, uh, Nicholas, you need to get close to your microphone. You are too low. Okay, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much, Madrita. We have a couple of questions in the chat, but in case you have any comments that you want to say out, or you have a question that you want to verbally ask, I think you can raise your hand and the moderator will allow you. The first question is uh, from Dr. Pasco, and she's asking, uh, where did you hear about the results of the study that you talked about? Was it through your doctor? Was it in a newspaper? What is the best place for a patient to learn about the use of biology testing? If that's the first question, thank you. Yes, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Pasco, for this important question. Uh, I heard about the study I've talked about. The study is called HPTN052. It's a study which proved beyond reasonable doubt that when you treat a person with HIV and he attains undetectable viral load test, he cannot transmit the virus to the partner. So that is the study. The news, I got the news in one of the conferences and I attended. And immediately I called my girlfriend and told her, hey, baby, guess what? There is this important information I've just got. It's called HPTN052. The good thing, my girlfriend is, is better than me when it comes to computers and uh, phones, WhatsApp and what. So what she did, she Googled about it and she read the whole story, how they had 1,600 discordant couples, divided them into two groups. And one group was given treatment, the other was denied treatment. And those who were not given treatment, there were 28 new infections. The one which was uh, given treatment, there the were no infection. So from that point, the HPTN052 changed our life. So I had the first information from the conference. What is the best place for a community person to know about this intervention? The best place should be a community-friendly place. But what happens? We get this information from the clinic. Most cases, clinics are so busy, they will give you half-backed information because they are busy. So we need a better place. And actually in Uganda, I didn't have time to explain. One of the things that I'm fighting to do and uh, I'm really trying to do, I'm creating what they call an adherence rehabilitation center. I'm setting up what they call an adherence rehabilitation center. A center whereby before you initiate any client on treatment, you bring that person to our center for like two or three days for orientation. And in case any person experiences challenges in adherence, you can bring that person for rehabilitation. 
So construction has been going on for the last seven years without any kind of funding, it's personal savings, struggling a lot. Most people don't find construction. I tried and tried and tried until I got disappointed. Everywhere I go, we don't find construction. We don't find construction. But hopefully in the future when it starts, it will be very useful and it will do this kind of work, Dr. Pasco, which you have asked. Thank you. Thank you, Moses. I, I just wanted to add to, to comment a little bit on what you are raising a very important point that it is, it, it, there is a need to translate the result of science or the, you know, the, the, the result and, and the knowledge that is out there translated so that you and I and, 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 and ordinary people can, can understand it. And when I say ordinary, I, I don't want to be, to be negative, but even for laboratory people, even for our community, we find it very difficult that the, all the standards and the guidelines and all those complicated documents that are supposed to help the laboratories, they are not well understood and you need to break it down into pieces that people can understand. So that, that's actually a call towards our, our stakeholders are on the call and I, and I hope that they hear that, that, um, that, that cry that, that, that we are having and, and the call that, that, we, that we send towards them. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Dr. Pasco. Uh, there are other questions in the chat, uh, still from Dr. Pasco. This is a question uh, that goes to all the stakeholders on the call, and not at the side with Moses. And the question is, uh, what are the opportunities out there to find community work in support of violent testing? Once again, what are the opportunities out there to find community work in fund your violent testing? And uh, uh, in response to this question, there is a comment uh, from uh, Dalila from Global Fund. I don't know whether Dalila would uh, just want to give this comment verbally so that I don't read it to make a little more emphasis. Sure, sure. I can give the comment. Um, basically, um, the the for the global fund um, funding request, the country coordinating mechanism, um, which we which we abbreviate as the CCM, puts forward um, the country's funding request. On that um, CCM, um, uh, usually there's a a, a seat that's um, uh, is held for someone from the community. And there should be ongoing um, country dialogue uh, throughout the entire uh, funding cycle. And what needs to happen is that um, the, the community uh, pieces um, around demand creation should be part and parcel of the funding request from countries when they put forward their request for viral load funding. So it's not just about um, equipment um, or even um, uh, the the uh, 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 the clinical uh, facility piece, but also um, you know the the global fund is is very um, interested in looking at these um, differentiated service delivery models and using and and um, using the community uh, to actually uh, um, uh, 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 really drive the impact um, that we want to see uh, around um, around these uh, uh, important uh, goals and targets. So I think that the, the community piece, um, the community work and for the, for the education and awareness needs to be part and parcel of the funding request. I hope that's clear, over. Thank you. Thank you very much. Yeah, there are, there are other global stakeholders on the call. There is George and then Clement. I don't know whether they would uh, want to talk more about this question before we proceed. The question about uh, the opportunities out there find community work in support of violent testing. Thank you. George of Clement. Yeah. Um, may maybe we should continue. I, just a quick um, comment um, on, on uh, community advocacy. I think a lot of countries, um, when we met in Uganda, I remember uh, in October, 
uh, those 11 countries that participated in, in the uh, lab commercial practice did put out um, or develop a demand creation plan. And part of that demand creation plan was to include advocacy. I think uh, it should go back now to these countries as they're supposed to work together with our, uh, as part of that controversial plan to, um, from the ministry ahead, putting, working together with uh, the, their PEPA counterpart to actually uh, develop this plan for commercial practice and for demand creation mm -hmm. to include uh, advocacy. So I, I think we should uh, hear back from um, those 11 countries that participated in that workshop what have they done? I mean, um, was that part of their uh, country plan to include advocacy? So if they did that, I think then there should be some um, recourse towards that or some response from uh, the funders, both Global Fund and PEPFA. So did they share that plan and then what, what was the action uh, thereafter? But we know that for PEPFA, uh, demand creation is really an issue, uh, an issue and we're working with our countries to make sure that they respond or, or they come up with a plan for this demand creation. So uh, we were basically piggybacking from the, the, uh, uh, the lab community of practice that took place in, in October last year in Uganda. So perhaps we hear back from you guys. Sure. Thank you very much. I don't know whether the judge has anything to say. I'll continue. George's microphone is off, so I think he's oh. not able to. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Yes, uh, maybe to respond to what uh, 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 Kelemet has said, we've been actually working with countries uh, to ensure that their action plans are captured within the country operation plan. And uh, it looks pretty much. Uh, the case as we've been following up with them that uh, they have been uh, really pushing and they have got all the assurance that uh, the action plans have been uh, captured. Actually, the decision making matrix that we developed was, uh, was a key resource that was used in designing uh, the, the counter operation plan from, from the PEPFAR groups that uh, we are behind this. So I think this time around there could be a change, but uh, the civil society, I think needs, they need to push their agenda also. They, uh, I think it is within Global Fund where they have a, 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 a ring fenced funding for civil society. I don't know whether PEPFA has ring fenced uh, for civil society, but uh, they, they need to have a strategy to push through and get uh, 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 proposals that can be funded. Yeah. Thank you yeah. very much. Let's continue with the questions. Uh, the other question is from uh, Gesh from ICAP, and uh, he is asking what are the ways for integrated activity of the civil societies and community advocates with the efforts of health workers at health facilities. What are the ways for integrated activities of the civil societies and community advocates with the efforts of health workers at health facilities? And he continues, what are the experiences of task shifting from the health workers to the civil societies and community advocates in Uganda? Yeah, I think Moses, and then I, we also have other members of civil society, like Victoria. Yeah, I think the floor is yours. Thank you. I didn't get the, the questions correctly. Can you do it for me? What are the experiences of health workers? What yeah. are the experiences? I think, I, I think yeah, that, that, that's a difficult question, the way it, it, it's written. But uh, so are you, as, as a member of the civil societies, are there any tasks that are normally conducted by nurses and clinicians that you are allowed to do in the community? I think it comes to that. And maybe Charles can, can actually help uh, in answering uh, some, some of these questions. Uh, Charles? Mm. Yeah, yeah, I think that's a... The, the, that's missing. It's not there. It's not there. Like I said, the health workers, their main job is to 
uh, treat, test and treat, but not to pass information. And the best way you can manage viral loss, the best way you can create a demand, like I said, is by empowering the clients. You can't demand for what you don't know. That is missing in Uganda, especially in my country where I come from. And in Africa in general, that is missing. People don't know the intervention. They don't even know the importance of this intervention. Why? Because the health workers are not passing the information to the clients. And they are busy, we can't blame them. That's why I'm saying, let's create champions. People who are not health workers, people who are not doctors, but people who are living in HIV, but who have the knowledge about the intervention so that they can help the health workers to pass on this important information to the community. Hope I've answered the question, thank you. Yeah, uh, I, I think uh, you're, you're right. And this is not, um, this is not really uh, a case uh, for Uganda. I think it is a case for many other countries. I think civil society is a, a great uh, partner in this whole uh, agenda of, uh, of scaling up viral load. And uh, for us to reach the last person, uh, if we don't engage civil society, we don't go far. But I think Uganda has started, Uganda has started uh, engaging civil society. And uh, there have been uh, quite a number of engagements between UNHLS and civil society. Maybe Victoria can say something about this. But we don't want really to concentrate on Uganda. We are yeah. talking about a principle. Because this is a principle that cuts across all, all the different countries. And uh, Uganda now has a coverage of over 90, like close to 93% because after they engaged civil society. But there are countries where the coverage is pretty much lower. And I know the engagement is much less in such countries. So this is a lesson that the rest of all of us should pick on, that uh, civil society are very critical stakeholders in this whole agenda of viral load. And uh, pretty much uh, ART intervention, and whatever HIV-related interventions we do, they are very critical in uh, stakeholders. And actually, I also call uh, international bodies like UNAIDS. Uh, they are doing an amazing job in ending HIV. And they even have plans of ending the HIV virus by 2030. But we are not going to end it without uh, uh, viral load intervention. And actually, as per report, they report people are doing very well to know their status. People are doing very well to be initiated on treatment. But when it comes to suppressing the virus, when it comes to monitoring the virus, that's what the problem is. So you are right to say the problem is not Ugandan. It's an international problem. Uh, people need to know about it and start act right now. Thank you very much. The other question from uh, Collins is uh, what percentage of patients would you estimate to lack knowledge on the importance of viral load testing in your experience? Once again, what percentage of patients would you estimate to lack knowledge on the importance of viral load testing in your experience? I would say 90%. I would say 90%. I would say as a community activist and advocate in Africa, 90%. People don't have this information, knowledge about it. They are doing it, but they don't know it. Okay. Yeah. So that's another 90 of the 90, 90, 90 that you are. You are bringing to our attention. <laughs> Knowledge. <laughs> they are doing it, but they don't know. Yeah, so it's really. creating another 90. Eh? Yeah, but <laughs> <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Interesting. Okay. Uh, it's good that you said actually they are doing it, but they don't yeah. know. Otherwise, uh, uh, if you didn't say that, uh, the question oh. could be challenged. But uh, 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 there you I, have I, a caveat. I, you may not be challenged. <laughs> yeah, I can even explain more. Like the treatment center where I pick my medication, uh, it is compulsory. 
doing a viral test is comparison. You must do it at least once every year. But majority of people do it and they take their blood and, and once the doctor knows that uh, you are okay, you are taking your medication correctly, you are doing very fine, then you go home. But the knowledge I'm talking about, the person, the client, needs to know the viral load, what it is, its importance, the repercussion of, of not doing it. I think that's, when we get there and we educate all of them, it will be much better than it is in Africa. Okay. Yeah, maybe we can answer one question if there's still one, uh, and then yeah. we... Yeah, the question is from uh, Anafi, and uh, it's a question that goes to everyone, all the participants, not only to Moses, and uh, he says, results for viral testing are often available timely, but often delivered to patients on the next visit. What innovative practices are available to ensure that results are reviewed on receipt and acted upon. Once again, results for violent testing are often available timely, but often delivered to patients on the next visit. What innovative practices are available to ensure that results are reviewed on receipt and acted upon? Thank you. Yeah, that's that, that's a question to the to the to me. It's a question for all of us, Moses. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> a question to, to us as health workers. Yeah. No, a, I think I, I think one of the things that we can do, like I said, is to to create demand. People are not demanding for it because they don't know it. You took my blood, I don't know the reason why you took it. How will I demand for it? How will I demand for its results? But when you educate me about it, when you educate me about its importance, I'll even take an initiative to come and check on it. And uh, maybe another thing that we can do is maybe to cut uh, the, 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 the time where clients visit the hospital from six months maybe to uh, one and a half months or two months. The minute you do a viral load test, you don't wait for your next hospital visit. You come back after like one month and a half to see your results. Okay. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, moderate, I'm requesting, there is one more interesting question in the chat that we end with it. And this says, uh, you had a girlfriend who did not have HIV and yet you had HIV. Did you tell her that you had HIV at the time you got up? And what was her reaction? Thank you. Oh, that's a very amazing uh, question. Now, which girlfriend? The first one or the second one? <laughs> I think it means the second one. Eh? <laughs> Because the, first one the first one disappeared. Okay, the good thing, the second one, I got the second one after she, after I'd come open. I'd come open, I'd started going on television, I started going on radio stations, I started going on uh, newspaper, telling people that I'm HIV positive, but I'm healthy. And most people are saying I'm lying because I'm one of the most handsome and good looking Ugandans in Kampala. So when I go on TV and talk to you that I'm HIV positive, you can't believe it. But this beautiful lady picked that interest from my intervention that I used to have on TV. And then we met, we had a meeting, and uh, we're discordant couples and we're using condoms strictly. But when we got to know about the HPTN 052 news, it changed everything. And uh, we're insisting on condoms all the time. But now we're, after HPTN 052, we began insisting on viral load testing and undetectable viral load stage. That's what we're aiming at. So I got this girlfriend. Uh, she already knew about my status. She knew I was HIV positive. But when you love someone, nothing can stop you from going for 
And when the person you love is good and handsome, then I think I hope I have answered your question. She knew about my status and she came knowing that I was positive. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, at the start, it was about condoms, but after that, it was about monitoring your viral load. Do you have viral. children and the children are HIV negative? Do you have children with that girlfriend? Yes, and like I said, three days ago, she gave mm. birth to a beautiful young boy. Okay. I have a three days old beautiful boy, and I've named this boy Ryan Imion Semirembe. Wow. Wow. So, uh, okay, she had challenges in giving the uh, in bringing the boy to us because she lacked the centimeters required, and we spent like 14 hours waiting. And she had only four, and yet they made they wanted ten. They were telling me centimeters, and uh, I didn't even you know. You don't understand. <laughs> and I was I was asking why not kilometers. <laughs> <laughs> so okay. they ended they ended up doing the Caesar, which was very expensive and costly and very uh, very scaring. It scared me a lot because she disappeared from me for like two hours. They were not allowing me to go there. They did the operation and it took so long. I didn't know what was going on. But thank God, she's doing very well, and the boy is very well, and okay. they're kicking. He's called okay. immune. So I have okay. a child, mm -hmm. and he's negative, I'm sure, because the mother is negative. Okay, okay, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. This has been a very interesting discussion, uh, and very real, real life, life experience, not, hypo, not hypothetical, but real life experience so rich and so empowering and inspiring. So I think there's quite a lot of learning that has happened in the course of the discussion. So we are coming to the close of our session. I want before to you thank close, you very much. Before, uh, bef yes. Before you close, a, a simple, quest, a simple re uh, request to all mm. friends there. If you have meetings, you have intervention, you have any kind of work you want me to participate in, just call me or send me an email. I'm ready to work with you guys. I'm ready to come and interact with your communities and uh, pass on the messages of treatment and adherence. Thank you so much. Okay. Okay, thank you, thank you. So, so uh, I think uh, we get you on to WhatsApp. Uh, uh, we we'll get you on to WhatsApp. I know other questions will come along the way, but uh, I think after here, we will get your phone number and put you on WhatsApp so that you can connect with so many people who are on this uh, WhatsApp group and you keep answering the questions that, that will come up. You'll get to know many other people and also many other contacts that will take your, 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 your efforts to another level. Otherwise, uh, time is almost up. I just want to remind you, we, have, uh, we are trying to check with you to know how many of you are going to be in MEXT for the National AIDS Conference. We want to have a side, kind of a side meeting to discuss a few and get updates on what is happening. Uh, if you are please going to be in Mexico, just make that, uh, just uh, send me a message. Uh, by, 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 by uh, mail or by uh, a text message uh, so that uh, we can plan for you. We, we want to know how many of our community members are going to be in Mexico uh, so that whenever we get an opportunity to meet, we don't lose, we don't want to lose the moment. We want to, you know, to check on what is happening and uh, how things are happening. And uh, we will continue and the discussion uh, uh, over WhatsApp for the questions that have not been answered. Uh, I want to thank you for a very interactive session. It's been very uh, a very free environment of discussion. Thank you, Moses, for being that free uh, uh, and being available, Lily, as an advocate. You are really very passionate at, at, at what you're doing, and I think a big inspiration for many other community members out there. They should be like you. Thank you very much. Dr. Pascal, do you want to, you want to say something?
No, that's perfect. Thank you so much, okay. Moses. <laughs> and thank, okay, you. thank you so much also. Okay. Thank, thank you, you, everybody. May you have uh, a good rest of the week. We will be telling you about our uh, waste management session that will be coming in the next about one week or two. Thank you. Be well for now. Bye.